Yeah, so uh, my name is Vikram and I'm an assistant professor in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering here at the University of Washington. And I just wanted to talk briefly about um, some of the work that we've been doing uh, on bio uh, biologging technologies at insect scale and some of the uh, exciting opportunities and challenges here. And so, you know, if we if we think about um, lots of the animals around us, um, you know, we've got uh, tiny, tiny creatures like pollinators, bees, um, that we really have absolutely no tools to be able to study, right? Um, these are these are little animals that can carry uh, less than a gram of weight and are often less than a centimeter in size, but still play pretty important roles um, uh, in ecosystems. And also, if we think about even uh, or looking beyond just insects, uh, if we look at uh, many bird species, they can also carry very, very limited amounts of weight. So, for example, this plot here shows a variety of different bird species um, with their their mass plotted on the x axis uh, versus the um, uh, the the number of species on the y axis on a, um, and and what we can see here is there's this really large concentration of species that weigh around 10 grams and considering birds can only carry three to five percent of their body weight this puts a maximum for our electronics payload at um, uh, at you know only 300 to 500 milligrams and uh, miniaturizing electronics for even smaller species like hummingbirds that can only carry 100 to 200 milligrams becomes even more challenging. And so, you know, uh, and, and looking um, looking beyond just uh, some of the existing tag technologies that are measuring location, um, there's a lot more that we could do if we could integrate other types of sensors as well. Like Yuki just talked about, if we can integrate things like cameras and accelerometers onto these, onto these little tags, there's lots of other data that we could collect to answer all kinds of different uh, interesting questions. And so a lot of my recent work has been on uh, integrating um, Internet of Things technologies uh, into, um, into different kinds of animal tracking applications. Um, so a few highlights here include a 100 milligram sensing platform that was small enough to ride on the back of a live bumblebee. Um, that's the first picture that you see here. Um, we've also done some work uh, that was used to uh, track and study um, invasive murder hornets that were found here in, in Washington state. Um, and uh, the last is a tiny wireless vision system, actually a little camera and accelerometer that uh, was small enough to fit on the back of a, a live beetle. And the common approach that runs through all of these systems is actually to use general purpose computing devices, the same sorts of little computing chips that are found in things like um, your, your wireless headphones and, and other devices, um, which as Melinda mentioned before, have been getting much more and more capable to actually build these without um, creating entirely new custom silicon, which really allows us to enable rapid prototyping and adapting these systems to lots of different, um, different types of applications. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I want to get started here first by looking looking in a little more detail at um, the um, uh, at, at the wireless sensors that we put on bees. Um, are my are my slides advancing here? Uh, let me see. Doesn't look right. Kid. Yeah. Give me just a second. Oh. All right. There we go. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the motivation behind this project was actually, you know, could we use, um, use live insects to carry wireless sensors in, you know, say in places like farms um, to, be, to be able to actually study environmental conditions rather than using a drone to carry around a sensor. And uh, what we ended up doing was, oh, there we go. So um, if I can get the video to play here. We actually have a um, a little uh, there we go. We've got we've got a little um, wireless uh, um, uh, wireless transmitter on the back of this live bumblebee, um, and it's carrying a uh, in this case a temperature and humidity sensor. We could also put other kinds of sensors on this as well. 
And the big challenges here are really developing for extremely small size and really low power for all of our electronics. And you know, one of the, the, size, the types of weights that we're talking about here um, is we used a battery that uh, weighs about 70 milligrams. And so then all of our electronics have to weigh around 30 milligrams. And so you know, one, of, one of the ways that we really reduce both the size and the power consumption um, is by using this technique called backscatter communication, where we communicate using reflected radio waves. And just to, to give a brief overview of how that works, let's say that you have this transmitting base station and a receiving base station um, that, that are plugged in somewhere and have plenty of power. One of the things that you can do here is that if you have an antenna connected to a switch that's toggling between two states on and off, you can actually change the reflection of that antenna and use that to communicate data um, to your receiver. And the cool thing about this technique is it consumes hundreds to thousands of times less power than a typical radio that you would find on your phone. And, um, and you can also implement that with very few components uh, with just a little microcontroller that's toggling this switch on and off. Um, and that's connected to a switch and an antenna. And the, uh, this is the same, the same core technology that's used in things like RFID. And oftentimes that's limited to a couple of meters because your reflections are, are pretty weak and your, um, your antennas add additional loss. Um, but one of the things that we've been able to do is by emulating techniques like, uh, like LoRa, um, we can actually enable reception at, at much longer ranges um, of say, say like 50 meters or so um, in some of our most recent work. And the cool thing is by, um, by, uh, by really reducing the, the amount of power that's required for, for these sorts of systems, we can even make them battery free, where here we have an example of a, um, a little battery free wireless sensor that we designed. Um, this is again measuring things like temperature and humidity. In another version of this, we actually included an accelerometer and magnetometer on this as well. And so, you know, if we can carry a little bit more weight also, I want to talk briefly about what we can do in terms of radio tracking of these um, invasive Asian giant hornets that were discovered here in Washington state. And this is work done with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. So these, these hornets are um, the Asian giant hornet or the, the murder hornet is, um, is this carnivorous species that's a major threat to bees. Um, and the worry is that this, you know, this invasive species is really gonna establish itself here in Washington and be uh, a big threat to, um, to native pollinators. And so what we did was we developed this tiny radio tracker um, that we could actually attach to, to the back of a live hornet. And what you see here is um, the, uh, the process of actually attaching um, one of these little radio tags to a hornet. Um, we sedated it by, by cooling it down. Um, and you can see Chris from WSDA here attaching this, this little radio tag onto the, um, onto the back of the hornet. And you know, by, by using these little tags, um, we, were, we were actually able to track a hornet back to its nest. Um, the, the core idea of how this worked is very similar to the sorts of VHF tags that, um, that we saw before, but um, in this case, just really shrinking them down to the absolute smallest size. Um, and, and with this, we were able to, to actually find a nest. And, and one of the cool things that we're trying to do going forward is adding new, or new sensors to this tag. Again, things like um, uh, things like an accelerometer, right? Or, or even just simple environmental sensors to figure out when the, um, uh, when the insect is actually inside its nest and, um, uh, and how long its, its foraging trips are. And the last thing that I want to comment on briefly is, um, you know, uh, the the little camera that we put on a live beetle. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll skip past some of the the details here, but uh, we actually take some inspiration from how you know um, how uh, vision is very power expensive on um, on you know live insects as well, um, where. Uh, their, their visual systems compute, or consume huge amounts of both mass and processing power. And, um, and so inspired by that, what we actually did in this system was we actually developed a really low power way to be able to move the camera. So then we can use a, a fairly low um, 
uh, or a lower resolution camera and then like expand our field of view just like um, real animals can can look around. Um, I've got a video here showing the uh, uh, showing the um, the camera attached to a live beetle and um, what you can see here is it's streaming data to a smartphone. Uh, this was actually triggered by an accelerometer as well. And with that, we were able to use um, to get um, uh, record for much longer amounts of time. Uh, basically, again, triggering a sequence of frames or capturing a sequence of frames whenever the animal started moving. Um, and maybe in the interest of time, I'll stop there and would be happy to take any questions. This was fantastic, and you're getting some uh, excited comments from, from the chat. I will pass to um, Andreas in a second, but I have two questions first. One is kind of echoing um, Emma's comment that microtechnology is such an under undertapped resource for conservationists. I'm just wondering how um, like you're doing such interesting, be able to ask such interesting questions and do cool work. What, how, how broadly applicable is this to beyond the the academic sphere um what how, yeah who else is access yeah how accessible is it oh yeah you know one, one of the really cool things about the you know kind of the approach that that we've been taking um using these you know basically programmable chips the same sorts of things that have been developed for um for consumer devices is we can easily adapt um adapt these systems to lots of different applications right we can connect i showed you cameras um uh you know we can connect uh, uh microphones accelerometers lots of different kinds of sensors to um uh to um, you know, various different combinations of computing chips and radios, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, what the, the applications that I showed here are specific to like wildlife tracking type things, right? Um, we could also use these same sorts of technologies for, you know, really any kind of low power wearable sensor or other, other types of medical technologies as well. Awesome. So my, the second part of my question was um, where, like I said, we're all mind blown. And we're just wondering what's the next thing on your agenda and your horizon? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, so we've got um, lots of lots of exciting ideas come, uh, going on from here. Um, I've got another part of my lab working on like, you know, building small robots that use these technologies, um, but also, um, we, you know, lots of people have reached out uh, interested in, um, uh, you know, in, in using these in um, uh, for studying a variety of different different type uh, different species like hummingbirds, uh, we have a partner on campus um, who is uh, interested in studying again foraging and hummingbirds. Right, um, we want to get a little accelerometer on a hummingbird so that we can use that to um, again track its motion, um, different different types of behaviors. Right, um, we have another partner here at UW who is studying. Um, uh, she's really interested in how uh, wildfire smoke. Um, here, here in the state, uh, when we have wildfires, how that's affecting um, uh, how that's affecting wildlife, um, and so you know we're we're interested in in some questions there around like can we put a little air quality sensor um, on this mm -hmm. animal uh, on, on something like a mule deer, right? Um, that they they've already got some of these species radio collared, combining that air quality data with movement data um, to to figure out how uh, or what some of the impacts of wildfire smoke are. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to throw to a couple of questions. Andreas, do you want to jump in? Yeah, hi. Hi, Vikram. Thanks. So this is super exciting for me. It's not the first time I hear you talk. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time like Roland in 95 uh, pulling frogs in the forest. And I, I really agree that it's not just insects, that there's all these small invertebrates, pretty much all amphibians, all small mammals, small birds that move at the smaller scale, a few hundred meters. But we, there's pretty much no tools for tracking other than, than running behind them so far. So given these uh, tools that you're developing, before we even go into piling up different sensors, what do you think are, are the near future perspectives of having some sensor node system to really detail track the movements? I've seen, I know that there's a couple of systems that have been used with radio tags, but all of them seem more of like engineering challenge currently than an actual deploying um, deploy system that could be deployed in the field. 
Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. And, you know, maybe maybe I'll go back to how we designed the, the system for tracking the Hornets, right? So in that case, again, because we were deploying this, we actually didn't really know where we were going to catch one of these, right? Um, ended up being like in the middle of a forest, like really close to the Canadian border. And so what we did there was we built our system in that case with um, very similar to, uh, like I mentioned, um, traditional VHF tags where you have like some kind of antenna and we had a bunch of people there that they could run around with those, right? Um, and you were really just trying to track that one hornet and we had some idea of the, the region that it was going to be in. Um, but, you know, the other thing that you could do is you could um, deploy uh, static nodes that have, um, you know, static receivers, right? Um, or, uh, or you could also use a drone with a receiver, right, to be able to automate gathering that data. Uh, I think it depends a little bit on, on what you're trying to do, right? Um, you know, I'm also, uh, or again, I, I think I saw one of the questions in, um, uh, in registration about using technologies like LoRa, right, um, for for species uh, that are you know slightly uh, uh, slightly larger than some of the ins insects, um, we could actually get pretty reasonable battery life, I think, um, with LoRa transmitters attached to them, and then you can um, you can actually do uh, tracking over like kilometers scale areas, right? Um, we could also think about approaches like um, for anyone who's familiar with uh, a GPS, like assisted GPS, where you have some, some device that gives the uh, GPS receiver a little bit of information to start with, that can significantly reduce the amount of power that it takes to get your GPS lock. And so that's, that's another approach that you could use there. Thank All right, you. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to read out a question from Svenja. Uh, how are the images and video files stored? Are there small memory cards in the devices or are they directly sent to a phone or other device like shown in the video? And how and if they are directly streamed, what is the range of which this works? Great question. So on, on the camera that I showed here on the Beetle, um, that we were actually directly streaming raw uncompressed data um, because it actually on, on the little chip that we were using, uh, it ended up being slower to do something like JPEG compression rather than just streaming the raw data. Um, but um, I think this is also a really interesting opportunity for, for future work. Um, for In terms of uh, distance we were communicating at, um, we could go up to uh, up to about 100 meters there um, and still receive images. Uh, as you go further and further, you get um, you get lower frame rate, right? Because your your wireless throughput starts going down. Um, but um, yeah, this is where I think that there are lots of inter interesting opportunities to um, to be able to uh, to implement things like um, whoops. Uh, so. So if you can implement um, uh, some, you know, like better compression on board, or uh, or even like some uh, some type of intelligent processing of those images, like recognizing a particular thing that you you want to see, right? We can um, uh, or making sure that's in your image, like um, some some. Um, like if you're foraging for food, that there's actually some object there, right? Um, then you could you could use that uh, to store uh, to store some images on the device. Awesome. And one final question for you before I bring everyone back in. Um, Emma asks, is this nanotech typically more expensive or cheaper to deploy? Yeah. So one one of the things here is also that um, a, a lot of these uh, a lot of these or by by making these systems physically small, um, they're they're often fairly cheap um, to build. Um, let's, uh, or, yeah, you can you can think that it would be, um, and we're again using uh, commercially available parts like the cameras and um, and radio chips. So um, uh, so I, I think that there's there's a lot of potential to really scale down costs there. <laughs> 